All right, class. So welcome to chapter eight on the nervous system. So we went through your skeletal system, the muscular system, and now we get to jump into the nervous system. There's two parts to this chapter. We'll see how far we get to today. Um, but this is just a general look at your nervous system, first of all, and we divide your nervous system into the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. The central nervous system consists of your brain and spinal cord, which travels down the length of your vertebra through those vertebral foramen. And then the peripheral nervous system includes all of the nerves that come off of the brain and spinal cord. So we'll get nerves to the lower limb, nerves to the upper limb. The ganglia refer to clusters of nerve cell bodies and then nerves to the face. So here are functions of the nervous system. So we go through kind of the anatomy, the functions, and then we'll get a little bit more detailed into um, the physiological process of the processes of the nervous system. So your brain and spinal cord uh, receive sensory input. They integrate the information that's received and they receive information from sensory structures throughout the body, whether they're in the skin, in your organs, so that they can change or respond to any problem or imbalance in homeostasis. Your nervous system controls muscles and glands. Remember learning about the muscle system and the motor nerve ending where your nerves go out and reach and innervate your muscles. Your nervous system maintains homeostasis because it makes sure everything is working properly and it establishes and maintains our mental activity. So this is our main breakdown or division of the nervous system. The central nervous system is your brain and spinal cord. Peripheral nervous system are all of the nervous tissue outside of the central nervous system. So that includes all the spinal nerves, the cranial nerves, the ganglia. We can also divide the nervous system into two parts, the sensory division and the motor division. The sensory division conducts all action potentials from the sensory receptors that are receiving stimuli from the external or internal environment to the CNS or the brain and spinal cord. And then the motor division conducts action potentials to effector organs such as muscles and glands. So sensory division takes in all this stimuli, the brain processes it, and then the motor division sends out some sort of response. We can also divide the nervous system into another way, into the somatic or autonomic. Um, the somatic nervous system, so we're kind of getting more and more detailed, like peripheral and central nervous system is kind of an anatomical division. Sensory and motor division are two very simple um, divisions in terms of the function of the nervous system. And then we get into a little more detailed functional divisions of the nervous system. The somatic nervous system transmits action potentials or a signal, remember an action potential just means a nerve is fired because it's carrying a sig signal from the central nervous system to the skeletal muscles. And an easy way to remember um, somatic nervous system is remember S for somatic and S for skeletal muscles. So your somatic nervous system conducts action potentials to your skeletal muscles. Yes, cranial nerves are peripheral nervous system. Good question, Kathy. And the autonomic nervous system transmit action potentials from central nervous system to cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands. So another way of dividing or thinking about your somatic or autonomic nervous system is the somatic is the voluntary division because you control the skeletal muscles. And the autonomic division is what happens automatically. So this is the part of the nervous system that happens and controls things without you knowing it. The heart, smooth muscle, and glands. And then the enteric nervous system is a special nervous system found only in your digestive tract. So the digestive tract kind of has, it, has its own kind of special division of the nervous system. So here are kind of how we've had these breakdowns of the organization of the nervous system. Um, if we kind of start at the bottom with sensory input. So this is everything that your nervous system takes in. Right now, your nervous system is taking in hearing the sound of my voice, the sight of your computer screen, maybe hearing other things going on in the background. I hear a lawnmower. Um, so that's all types of sensory input, the smell of your coffee, light, sound, taste, touch, temperature, pain, or pressure all gets picked up by sensory receptors, travels through the sensory division and into the central nervous system, which is your brain and spinal cord. The brain and spinal cord will then process, integrate, um, and kind of figure out what the body has just received, 
and then to figure out how to respond to that stimuli. So maybe if you're listening to me talk, your brain is the higher processing centers of your brain are kind of taking what I'm saying and remembering it and memorizing it all. Or you're smelling your coffee and you want to take a sip of it. So the brain is processing it, integrating all these senses that are coming in and then sending out some sort of response. And this is where we divide up the motor division into the somatic nervous system, which again is voluntarily affecting your skeletal muscles. Um, so if you're really cold, the sensory receptors in your skin would tell your brain, hey, maybe we need to start shivering our skeletal muscles to get warmer. The motor division, division then, the other side, the autonomic nervous nervous system division is everything that happens automatically. So we can divide your autonomic nervous system into the sympathetic and parasympathetic division where the, these effectors are your cardiac and smooth muscle, the glands, everything that happens automatically in the body without you knowing about it. Um, and that kind of all consists of motor output. So it causes you to move, changes in your metabolism, heart rate, breathing rate, et cetera. So that's how we organize the nervous system. Then the cells of the nervous system, you just kind of have two types of cells in your nervous system. You have neurons and you have glial cells. The neurons itself are kind of the main cell of the nervous system. These cells receive stimuli, conduct the action potential down their axon, and then transmit signals to other neurons or to an effector organ like your skeletal muscle at the neuromuscular junction, which is what we talked about last week. And then the glial cells are all of the supporting cells. So these cells do not conduct action potentials. They're specific glial cells of the CNS and in the PNS. And instead these glial cells carry out different functions that enhance neuron function and maintain normal conditions within the nervous tissue. And we'll go through what those glial cells look like. But first we'll look at a neuron or a nerve cell. It has a cell body, which contains one single nucleus. Uh, usually it contains several dendrites, which is some sort of um, extension from the cell body. So we call it a cytoplasmic extension. The dendrites are usually the parts that receive information from other neurons and then transmit the information to the cell body. And then the axon is usually a single long cell process that leaves the cell body at a place called the axon hillock. The axon hillock is just the place where the axon connects to the cell body and then conducts those sensory signals to your central nervous system and motor signals away from the central nervous system. So here's a look at a typical neuron, um, a typical nerve cell. And I also like to kind of compare it to your hand and your arm. So if you think about your fingers are the dendrites and the dendrites are shown as these extensions coming off of the cell body. Then the neuron cell body is like the palm of your hand with the nucleus in the middle. That's just the main integrating center. So the dendrites receive information, the neuron cell body integrates um, that signal, and then the axon is the long extension. So think of it as the long arm leaving the cell body. This is where um, the axon connects to the cell body called the axon hillock kind of this area right here. And then you might have other axons shooting out of the kind of central axon. Within the axon, you have what we call Schwann cells, which are a part of a glial supporting cell. And Schwann cells create what we call myelin sheaths that we'll talk about. And then the spaces in between Schwann cells create little nodes or spaces called nodes of Ranvier. And we'll talk about what those are. And then the axon usually kind of branches at the end um, where these branches will go to maybe a skeletal muscle, a gland, or another effector organ. So that's a typical neuron. Structural types of neurons, they can be multipolar where they have many dendrites and a single axon. This is the most common type of neurons within your central nervous system. Um, and nearly all of the motor neurons that conduct a motor response are all multipolar. And again, they look similar to the structure that we just talked about. But some neurons may be bipolar, where they just have two processes, one dendrite and one axon. And we'll see some bipolar neurons in some of the sensory organs, like the retina of the eye and in the nasal cavity. You might have a pseudo unipolar neuron that has a single process extending from the cell body 
which will then divide into two processes a short distance from the cell body. Um, one process extends to the periphery, the other extends to the CNS, and the ex two extensions function as a single axon with small dendrite-like sensory receptors. This is very um, rare or a less common type of neuron. And here we have the three different types of neuron. Again, the multipolar neuron is the most common that you'll find in motor neurons or the central nervous system. The bipolar neuron will find in parts of the eye called the retina, and then a sooty unipolar neuron with just one kind of branch has the cell body off to the side. So then we'll talk about glial cells. So again, glial cells are all of the supportive cells of the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And you should know the basic types of glial cells. I think the test question where you'll be tested on glial cells is like a matching question. So you'll have all the glial cells listed in one column and then the descriptions of each on the top and then you have to match the two. Um, we like those types of questions because it, you can test a lot of information at one time. So astrocytes are a type of glial cell and they serve as the major supporting cells in the brain and spinal cord. So that's the CNS. Astrocytes can stimulate or inhibit the signaling activity of nearby neurons and form what we call the blood-brain barrier. And I'll show you a picture about what I mean by that. And ependymal cells line the cavities in the brain that contain cerebral spinal fluid. Microglial cells are a type of an immune cell in the central nervous system. They act by removing or eating up bacteria and cell debris that have kind of like fallen apart. Oligodendrocytes provide myelin or create myelin to neurons in the central nervous system. So again, if you remember anything today, remember that oligodendrocytes are found in the brain and spinal cord, your central nervous system. Schwann cells do the exact same thing. They provide myelin, they, so, and we'll talk about what myelin is. They create myelin, but only in the peripheral nervous system. So oligodendrocytes are in the central nervous system, your brain and spinal cord. In the peripheral nervous system, we'll find Schwann cells. So these are the types of glial cells. And here we have an astrocyte. So we'll go over one at a time here. So an astrocyte kind of has what we call these perivascular feet or foot processes that are able to wrap around blood capillaries in the brain. And when they do that, they form a barrier between the blood and the capillaries and the surrounding tissue in the brain. And we call that the blood brain barrier. So what astrocytes will do is they help protect certain things in the blood from leaking out of the capillaries into the brain tissue because they formed this barrier with this, their feet to kind of keep out you know, harmful substances in the blood from getting into the tissues in the brain. Two things that can get through this blood brain barrier are alcohol and nicotine. So alcohol and nicotine have such a fast effect on people because the astrocytes cannot stop that from getting into the brain tissue. Here are ependymal cells. This is the second one we talked about. They have cilia, they line the cavities of the brain that contains cerebral spinal fluid. So they help to move or circulate around cerebral spinal fluid. Microglial cells are large immune cells that help to like engulf or destroy or get rid of um, cell debris. And then we have the oligodendrocytes, which are found in the brain and spinal cord, the CNS. And they create myelin. And what myelin does is it forms this kind of white electrical tape kind of structure around the axons of your neurons to help speed up the process of action potentials traveling down those neurons. And then here is the Schwann cell or a nucleus of the Schwann cell, how it's surrounding the axon. And you can see the layers of myelin, kind of like rings of a tree surrounding the axons. And again, myelin is like electrical tape. It wraps around the axons to help increase the speed of action potentials. And this is where we'll talk more about myelin. So the myelin sheath uh, or sheaths are specialized layers that wrap around axons of some neurons. Those neurons are termed myelinated if they have axons wrapped around them. The sheaths are formed by oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system and Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system. And myelin is just an excellent insulator that prevents almost all ion movement across the cell membrane. 
So remember that action potentials travel down um, if when ions don't, when ions move in, but if we prevent that movement, the action potential can just go straight through. If there's a gap in the myelin sheath, so every so often there's a little space in the myelin sheath, and that is called the, those gaps are called the nodes of Ranvier, and they occur about every millimeter. And at the nodes of Ranvier, we do have ion movement. So that means that the ions will rush into the axon at the nodes of Ranvier. So what happens is we get kind of this jumping of an action potential between or at the nodes of Ranvier to help speed up the action potential. Myelination of an ax axon, axon increases the speed and efficiency of action potential generation along the axon. Um, multiple scler sclerosis, for example, often we call this MS. Um, it affects, we don't know why, but oftentimes MS starts affecting women in their 30s. And there's no cure for it. There's just kind of, kind of a maintenance um, um, prognosis or taking, you know, just taking care of it. But MS is specifically a disease of the myelin sheath that causes loss of muscle function. So what multiple sclerosis does is it kind of destroys the myelin sheaths on your axons so that the axons can't conduct their action potentials as quickly and you start to lose muscle function because they're not getting the innervation they need from the nerves. Unmyelinated axons lack the myelin sheath, so they do not have them. These axons will rest in indentations of the oligodendrocytes and the Schwann cells. And a typical small nerve, which consists of axons of multiple neurons. So if we think about nerves in our body and we'll learn where they're located. But for example, in your forearm, you have an ulnar nerve and a radial nerve. And what a nerve is, and if we were to dissect a cadaver, we could see kind of white nerves throughout the body. Um, a, a nerve just consists of many, many axons kind of bound together. And usually some contain unmyelinated and some contain myelinated. And there's often more unmyelinated axons than myelinated. So this is just a look at a myelinated axon. Um, you can see how it's completely surrounded the axon, which is shown this yellow part is the axon of the neuron. And you can see how the layers of myelin sheaths are completely surrounding it until we get to kind of a space, a node of Ranvier where there's none versus an unmyelinated axon. You see several axons coming together to form a nerve, but you see spaces um, in between the Schwann cells and you don't see any layers of myelin surrounding them. The organi organization of nervous tissue, we can organize your nervous tissue based on the color because the color is due to the abundance or the absence of these myelinated axons. Nervous tissue can be gray matter or white matter, and myelin is white. So gray matter consists more of groups of neuron cell bodies and their dendrites where there is not much myelin. And white matter consists more of the bundles of the axons, which are usually covered in myelin sheaths. And myelin is whiter in color, so white matter usually consists of axons. Membrane potentials. So this is where we'll talk a little bit about um, the differences of ions, resting membrane potentials. We covered this a little in muscle tissue, and now it, hopefully you'll get it in nervous tissue. So we'll talk about resting membrane potentials and action potentials, which also occur in neurons. And when we're talking about a membrane potential, these potentials are describing uh, the change or the difference in charge of ions at the membrane, uh, the membrane, the cell membrane of a neuron. And these differences are due to concentrations of ions across the membrane, membrane channels in the sodium potassium pump, Membrane channels include leak channels and gated channels. Leak channels are always open so that ions can constantly leak in or out. And gated channels are generally closed but can be opened due to a voltage or some sort of chemical. So a leak channel is always open. Ions can leak across the membrane, usually down their concentration gradient. Um, there are usually about there's a lot more um, potassium leak channels than sodium leak channels. So the resting membrane has much more permeability to the potassium than to sodium. Therefore, the potassium leak channels have the greatest contribution to the resting membrane potential. And that just means that there's just more of them, about 50 to 100 times more.
Gated channels are closed until they're opened by a specific signal that can be coming from an action potential or something else, a different chemical. Chemically gated channels are opened only when a neurotransmitter or another chemical um, binds to it, whereas voltage gated channels are opened by a change in membrane potential like an action potential. So with a chemically gated channel, a neurotransmitter like acetylcholine has to bind to it, whereas a voltage gated channel usually will open in response to an action potential traveling down the axon. When they are opened, the gated channels can change the membrane potential and are thus responsible for the action potential. And we're gonna go through the action potential in a little bit, um, but now we'll learn about the sodium potassium pump. Um, this compensates for the constant leakage of ions through the leak channel. So remember that we have a lot of potassium leaking out of the cell. The sodium potassium pump uses energy and it tries to maintain the resting membrane potential by actively transporting potassium back into the cell because it's constantly leaking out and sodium out of the cell. And it always um, transports two potassium in. So I'm just gonna write two K in and for three sodium out. And I'm sorry, my writing is just terrible here. I should use, I think there's a typing function. So two potassium in and three sodium out. So what this channel does is it basically takes three sodium inside the cell, two potassium, and it just switches them at the same time, but it uses energy. Um, the sodium potassium pump consumes about 25% of all the energy or the ATP in a typical cell and about 70% of the ATP in a neuron. So our body needs to constantly be creating ATP. And that's what it does. When you guys eat an apple and the apple gets broken down into glucose, glucose enters into this cellular respiration cycle to create ATP because all of our body processes need ATP. And in a neuron, a neurons will consume about 70% of the ATP just by using it on the sodium potassium pump. So resting membrane potential. Let's talk about what happens when your nerves are at rest. They're not being stimulated. This resting membrane potential exists because potassium is higher on the inside of the cell and sodium is higher on the outside of the cell. So these are positively charged ions. Potassium is always higher on the inside of a neuron. Sodium is always the concentration of sodium. There's more sodium on the outside. There's also on the inside of your neurons, lots of huge proteins, which contain negative charges. And because these proteins contain negative charges and on, they're on the inside of the cell, they're too large to exit. And this gives the inside of the cell right underneath the membrane a more negative charge to it because all of these negatively charged proteins. The presence of leak protein channels in the membrane is more permeable to potassium. That just means that potassium is constantly leaking out. Sodium will always tend to diffuse into the cell because it's traveling down its concentration gradient. So I'm kind of putting up here is outside of the cell, down here is inside of the cell. Sodium is more concentrated on the outside of the cell. So when there are leak channels open or a gated channel open, sodium will travel down its concentration gradient into the cell and potassium will always tend to diffuse out following its concentration gradient. And again, in order to maintain the resting membrane potential, the sodium potassium pump is constantly working to recreate these gradients by pumping more sodium out and more potassium in. So here's resting membrane potential. In a resting cell, there's a higher concentration of the purple circles, which are potassium. So purple is potassium and there's a higher concentration of potassium inside of the cell. And the pink circles are sodium. And you'll see sodium, there's a higher concentration of sodium outside the cell. And these arrows refer to the concentration gradients of sodium. So sodium will travel down its concentration gradient, meaning it will always go from an area where there's higher sodium into the cell where there's less. And that's called diffusion. Potassium always will travel out of the cell, traveling down its concentration gradient where there are less potassium out of the cell. These leak channels refer to sodium and potassium just leaking through the cell membrane. And again, you can see there's more purple leak channels because there's more potassium leak channels.
the sodium potassium pump, um, it's not necessarily a gated channel. It, it will remain closed. It's like, it, it is kind of like a gated channel. It can only open in the presence of ATP. Good question, Kathy. So here it's showing there are more potassium leak channels than sodium. So you'll just see potassium leaking out of the cell. And again, in green, you see these huge negative charged pro proteins. So this is what gives the inside of the cell at resting. Um, the resting cell potential is about negative 70 um, millivolts. So um, remember, we're talking about potential. So we're measuring a charge, a voltage. So the inside of the membrane at resting is about negative 70 millivolts, mainly due to these negatively charged proteins. But this is just showing how leakage channels are more open, or they're always open, but there's just more potassium. Yes, Matt. The sodium potassium pump has the ATP bind to the channel protein to open and then allow the sodium and potassium to move. And I think we'll get to that. So here's the sodium potassium pump. So this is what this one looks like. You guys are ahead of me, which is great. So you can see here, um, again, the pink is the sodium. So we are trans transporting three sodium out. And again, the pink is sodium. And we're transporting two potassium back in. So here's two potassium. And it's not necessarily a gated channel. It's more like its own separate channel because it needs ATP. And you can see here the ATP needs to bind in order to do this process. Because remember why an ATP is so important for energy is that energy is found in its um, bonds between these phosphate groups. So when we break a bond or take a phosphate away, so we've turned adenosine triphosphate with three phosphate groups into adenosine diphosphate with two phosphate groups. We've broken a bond. And when we break a bond, that releases the energy that we need to do this transfer. Um, so this is the sodium potassium pump, and this is all to maintain this resting membrane potential. And again, resting membrane potential is negative 70 millivolts inside the cell. Yeah, I don't think it falls into a gated chemical or voltage channel specifically. It's kind of its own. It's just the sodium potassium pump. It's more in it. It's not even really called a channel. It's more like a pump because it requires energy but I'll double check that. But I think it's separate from the other types. Okay, so we've had, we've established how the inside of the cell maintains negative 70 at all times. That's again called resting membrane potential. Now we're gonna talk about what happens when your neurons get stimulated. And this is what an action potential is. An action potential allows a conductivity or an electrical signal to pass along the nerve or the muscle membrane, what we learned about last week, just really similar to electricity going along electrical wire. So our nervous system, you have electricity pumping through your body at all time, and it travels through your neurons in a form of action potentials. The channels responsible for the action potential are what we call voltage-gated channels, meaning they can only be opened when there's a change in membrane potential, and they're closed during rest or resting membrane potential. When a stimulus will be applied to a nerve cell, usually following a neurotransmitter activation of a chemically gated channel, um, sodium channels open first and they open very briefly. And sodium, once sodium voltage gated channels open, sodium moves down its concentration gradient. So it diffuses rapidly into the cell because remember there's always more sodium outside of the cell. So as soon as these sodium channels open, sodium rushes into the cell and it brings with it this positive charge because each sodium ion has a positive charge to it. This movement of sodium with its positive charge, it's called a local current, it causes the inside of the cell to become more positive. And that's just because if we're adding a bunch of sodium, positively charged ions into the cell, the inside of the cell becomes more positive and we call this depolarization. And this is the first step of an action potential. If depolarization is not strong enough, the sodium channels will close again and the local potential disappear with, will disappear without actually being conducted along the nerve cell membrane. But if depolarization is large enough, sodium will enter the cell so that the local potential reaches what we called a threshold value. 
I just kind of exited that out. This threshold depolarization causes voltage-gated sodium channels to open, generally all at the axon hillock. And again, that's why I pointed out what, where that axon hillock was located. Um, the axon hillock, again, is where the axon connects to the cell body. And the axon hillock um, is where a lot of these voltage-gated sodium channels will open and where depolarization starts in the neuron. The opening of these channels causes a massive 600-fold increase in membrane permeability to sodium. Um, so that's kind of where we get an action potential. All the sodium rushes in, we get to threshold, and then the voltage-gated potassium channels begin to open. So they kind of are open at the same time, slowly, and as more sodium enters the cell, depolarization will continue at a much faster pace causing a brief reversal of charge so that the inside of the cell becomes more positive. And again, that's just because when we're adding a bunch of sodium ions into the cell, the inside of the cell becomes a little bit more positive. And that's always relative to the outside of the cell. So when we talk about resting membrane potential is negative 70, um, it's always we're talking about the inside of the cell relative to the outside. Depolarization, the inside of the cell becomes more positive. Once that happens, the charge reversal causes sodium channels to close. And as soon as sodium channels close, sodium stops entering. So then we've kind of hit our action potential peak, as they say. And during this time, more potassium channels open. So what happens when potassium channels open? We know that there's a higher concentration of potassium inside of the cell. So if more potassium channels open, potassium will leave the cell. Potassium also has a positive charge to it. So when potassium leaves the cell, it's taking its positive charge with it. So this is what we call repolarization because the inside of the cell will become more negative again when potassium leaves. At the end of repolarization, we get into this hyperpolarization stage. And this is where the charge on the cell membrane briefly comes more negative than the resting potential. So we might be at about negative 90 here. Remember, negative 70 was resting membrane potential. And if you know the potassium channels may stay open, so a lot of potassium leaves taking with their positive charge. So we get extra negative, and this is called hyperpolarization, or maybe dipping into negative 90, maybe negative 100, and this is called hyperpolarization. Yes, Kathy. So when we'll go through what consists of the brain in a little bit, but the brain is the cerebrum, the cerebellum, and the brainstem. Yes, but we'll go over that, I think, in part two of this a little more in detail. Um, action potentials are what we call an all or none, or occur in what we call an all or none fashion. I also like to say an action potential or firing of a neuron, getting a signal to pass through. Um, I also like to call it a domino effect. And this is what I mean by that. The all or none refers to the fact that if that threshold value is reached, an action potential will occur no matter what. And if the threshold value is not reached, no action potential occurs. And the threshold value for the inside of the cell needs to get to about negative 50 for this threshold to reach for an action potential to occur. And as always, the sodium potassium pump assists in restoring the resting membrane potential. So at hyperpolarization, we might be a little too negative. And this is helpful because then the cell can't be kind of stimulated again right away. So the sodium potassium pump will try to exist in restoring that resting membrane potential back to negative 70. Got a couple more questions. Is the action and resting potential always going back and forth? Yes, so the resting membrane potential is negative 70. That's like when your nerves are at rest, they're not moving at all. Then the action potential refers to depolarization when sodium rushes in and the inside of the cell becomes more positive. Yes, Kathy, cranial nerves are on the brain, but they're technically, they, they leave the brain. So they leave the brain and the spinal cord, some come off of the brain stem and they go to parts of the face. One even goes down to the thoracic cavity. So technically cranial nerves are still a part of the peripheral nervous system. Cameron, great question. How fast do you think this process occurs in the body? How fast can your nerves respond to stimuli? Less than milliseconds this is happening. Your nerves are being fired 
And I mean, think about you guys are hearing me talk and you can hear it and you can take in what I'm saying. So it's happening instantly. Um, that's your nervous system taking in action potentials because what I'm saying, my voice is going through um, receptors, sound receptors in your ear. And in your ear, your ear has specific neurons that go through these action potential stages. So this happens instantaneously. Good question, Yolanda. So I mean, so all of your nerves, um, when they're not being stimulated, so resting membrane potential, so at rest, so for example, you're right. I mean, our nerves are usually constantly being stimulated, but we can't stimulate our nerves constantly. They always have to go back to like a resting or stopping. They'll be fired for a stimuli and then they'll rest. That could happen, you know, in milliseconds too. So that's a good question, Yolanda, but resting potential might be, um, I mean, I'm trying to think of a nerve that's at rest right now. If you close your eyes and you're not, the neurons, they're called photoreceptors in your retina. When you close your eyes, they're not being stimulated right now. So those photoreceptors would be at rest. Um, but yeah, you're right. A lot of your neurons are constantly going, but they're still being firing these action potentials. So within firing, there is a rest period. Good question. You guys are asking great questions. I don't know if I've had a class with this many questions. So props to you guys. Um, so here's what I mean. Yeah, so that's a good way of saying it. Um, well, they're at rest when they're not acting or receiving stimuli. Yes. And when they're not being stimulated. Um, so, you know, think of receptors in your skin right now. I mean, I don't feel any pain in this part of my body. So the pain receptors in this parts of my skin are not being stimulated. So they're at rest. Yes, we'll talk about at the end of this chapter how our nervous system is slowing down with age, for sure. Yes, we, pretty much everything slows down as we get older, but the nervous system does too. And a lot of, um, you know, think of ALS, multiple sclerosis. There's a lot of diseases that affect the nervous system. Um, you, we get to do a whole class on that. And it usually affects the ability of your nervous system to be electrically stimulated and send signals. Um, you know, paralysis, there's so, yeah, there's a lot of things that affect the nervous system. Um, polio, for example, years ago, um, polio affected um, the nerves reaching your diaphragm. So what polio did is um, if nerves can't stimulate your diaphragm, people with polio weren't able to breathe because the diaphragm is the main muscle associated with breathing to enlarge your thoracic cavity and de decrease it. So that's why I don't know if you've guys seen those pictures of people in the, what it was it, 30s, 40s, maybe less, um, in those iron cages, they would put in these iron cages and they'd basically be pressure chambers to help expand and decrease their rib cage because they lost nervous stimulation to their diaphragm. Sometimes it was um, intermittent and they would just have to go in the iron cage for a little bit. Other times they would live the rest of their life in these iron chambers um, to help, I digress, the iron lungs. Yes, Cameron. Yep. They're, it's fascinating. These iron lung machines. I knew someone who their sister was had polio and they just had an iron lung machine in their living room. And that's where she was um, for the rest of her life. Sometimes she could take portions out of it. You know, some of the nerves, maybe her diaphragm could do a little bit of work, but that's what polio did is it also affected the nervous system, the nerves going to the diaphragm. That's why the polio vaccine was such an amazing thing because it, I mean, you saw these kids in iron lungs and then for a vaccine to come and get rid of that was very, very great. Good questions, guys. Yeah. Check out iron lungs. It, it's just fascinating in polio. Um, what those people went through. Oh man. Okay. So action potential, let's just go through these steps. So number one, resting membrane potential. So whether the nerve, I, you know, I wouldn't say the nerve is at rest, but it's not being stimulated. And that's probably a better way of saying it. This nerve is not being stimulated. Um, so everything's closed. The gated channels are closed and the pink gated channel refers to the sodium gated channel and purple refers to potassium. Um, again, there might be some leakage channels open, but this is resting membrane potential. The gated channels are closed, but we will see more sodium outside and more potassium inside. And this is occurring along the axon and specifically action potentials will sometimes start in the axon hillock where sodium channels will open 
here we have depolarization as kind of the first step or the, the second step of the action potential. And this is where sodium channels open and sodium rushes into the cell. It diffuses into the cell. And on this kind of graph here, we show time in milliseconds because this is happening in like, I think it's exactly, it's about one to two milliseconds. And then on the Y axis, we show the membrane potential. So here's resting at negative 70. The threshold dotted line, this occurs at about negative 50. So if enough sodium channels open and we can pass that threshold kind of value, we'll get to an action potential peak right away. And this is called the action potential peak where all sodium channels have opened, sodium rushes into the cell, sodium brings its positive charge into it. So that's why we have this upswing in the graph because sodium makes the inside of the cell more positive. So that's why we're becoming more positive on the inside of the cell. Sodium channels close and now potassium channels start and are kind of all open at this point. And when potassium leaves and diffuses out of the cell, it brings its positive charge with it. So on the graph, the inside of the graph becomes more negative again because potassium leaves with its positive charge. So we have fewer positive charges inside the cell. So it becomes more negative again. And this little dip, and I don't think we go through it, this little dip here is called hyperpolarization, where it's a little bit too negative. And to get back up to resting in black, that's where the sodium potassium pump helps to reestablish these ion concentrations and charge concentrations so that we get back up to resting. Okay, so a little more about unmyelinated and myelinated axon and how myelin helps to propagate action potentials more quickly. Um, action potentials are conducted more slowly in unmyelinated axons and more rapidly in myelin. Um, action potentials along unmyelinated axons occur along the entire membrane. And like what we talked about before, the action potentials in myelinated axons can kind of occur in a jumping pattern at the nodes of Ranvier, which are those spaces between myelin sheaths. And that's because at those nodes, you have all the ion channels that can open. Remember I said that those myelin sheaths can't open ions there, but at the nodes, the spaces, that's where the ion channels can open. So we kind of have this great concentration of ion channels at these nodes. So the action potential will jump and we call that saltatory conduct conduction. Again, Latin roots here, saltar to jump. Um, that's called saltatory conjunction, conduction, how the action potential jumps through those nodes. And this is just showing the unmyelinated action, ax, action potential along an axon. So this just shows kind of a normal depolarization route, showing how this area is becoming depolarized. So it's becoming positive on the inside, and then it continues to pass along down the axon. Whereas the myelinated axon conduction, conduction occurs more quickly. Here's the direction of our action potential. It becomes positive where there's a bunch of ions, and then it'll continue to jump. Um, why the area the arrow goes back that way because I think it should be going this way because it's showing the direction of the action potential. That's a generalized, it's a local current. Um, so this is just showing how the action potential here is where it's become depolarized on the inside. And then the second step, it's jumping to the next area and then it's jumping to the next area. So we kind of have the saltatory conduction of the action potential down the axon. Axon conduction speed, the speed of action potential conduction varies widely, even among myelinated axon, because it's based on the diameter of the axon fibers. So a medium diameter, lightly myelinated axon conducts action potentials at the rate of about three to 15 meters per second. Um, and large diameter, heavily myelinated axons conduct action potentials at the rate a 15 to 120 meters per second. Can someone um, change this into MPG miles per hour? Maybe that would give us a better understanding of um, how fast this is. Another question, Professor, where are the microglial cells located? Good, microglial cells are located in the central nervous system. Good question. 
So 120 meters per second in um, MPG, unless you guys are good with this, um, meters per second to miles per hour. Let's see, MPH, not miles per gallon. It's about 270 miles per hour is the fastest. 33 is, I think, yeah, 15, good. So we're talking about between 33 to up to about 270 miles per hour is the speed of conduction of these action potentials down your neurons, which makes sense because it's happening very fast. So then we'll talk about synapses. We talked a little bit about synapses when we were at the neuromuscular junction. A neuroneuronal synapse is a synapse between two neurons. It's a junction where the axon of one neuron interacts with another neuron. The end of the axon usually forms what we call a presynaptic terminal, and the membrane of the next neuron forms the postsynaptic terminal. So the presynapse and then the postsynapse um, with, with a synaptic, synaptic cleft or a space between the two membranes. So central nervous system, um, the microglial cells are like the macrophages. So it's like the central nervous system. It's like their type of immune cell are the microglial cells. Good question, Kathy. Chemical substances called neurotransmitters are stored in the synaptic vesicles in the presynaptic terminal. An action potential reaching a presynaptic terminal or the end of one axon will cause voltage-gated calcium channels to open and calcium moves into the cell. Remember, calcium is kind of our special ion that's needed. When we get an influx of calcium, this always causes a release of the neurotransmitter by exocytosis. The same thing happened with the neuromuscular junction. We needed a calcium to enter to release acetylcholine into that muscle cell. The same thing happens in the neuronal neuronal synapse where we're kind of connecting two neurons together. Calcium will cause the release of a neurotransmitter from the presynaptic terminal. The neurotransmitter will diffuse across the synaptic cleft. It will bind to receptor molecules on the postsynaptic membrane and the binding of these neurotransmitter to the membrane of the second neuron will then cause chemically gated channels for sodium, potassium, or um, chloride to open or close in the postsynaptic membrane. The specific channel type and whether or not the channel opens or closes always depends on the type of neurotransmitter and the type of receptor. So the type of neurotransmitter being released from the presynaptic terminal, that's the first neuron, and the type of receptor that's being bound to it on the postsynaptic membrane. And this is really interesting. The response can either stimulate or inhibit the next neuron in the postsynaptic cell. If sodium channels open, the postsynaptic cell becomes depolarized and an action potential will result if threshold is released. And if we have potassium or chlorine chloride channels open, the inside of the postsynaptic cell becomes more negative or hyperpolarized, and that usually inhibits an action potential from occurring because if we get to be too negative or too hyperpolarized, an action potential can't occur. So we've inhibited or stopped the signal from transmitting. There's lots of many neurotransmitters. And if you go on to the next anatomy and physiology, you'll learn more. Um, the best known are acetylcholine and norepinephrine. Can you give an example of this? Yeah, maybe I'll show, let's see if we show a picture of the synapse and then maybe that'll help a little bit. Um, neurotransmitters do not normally remain in the synaptic cleft indefinitely. So what that means is when we have this synapse between two neurons, we need to release neurotransmitters across the cleft to start or inhibit an action potential on the next neuron. We don't just constantly have these neurotransmitters kind of hanging out here because otherwise we'll be constantly inhibiting or stimulating the next neuron. These substances become reduced in concentration when they're either rapidly broken down by an enzyme or they're transported back into the presynaptic terminal. And a really well-known enzyme is called acetyl acetylcholine esterase, which breaks down the acetylcholine. Norepinephrine, that neurotransmitter, will either be actively transported back into the presynaptic terminal or broken down by enzymes. When a person is having low calcium or high calcium, yeah, calcium levels will affect everything because calcium is needed with the nervous system. 
to start kind of the release of these synaptic vesicles, calcium is really um, needed in a lot of other parts of the body too. So levels of calcium in the body are incredibly important. So here's kind of a picture and Yolanda, let me know if this answers your question about an example or just maybe hopefully it'll help by seeing this um, a little bit better in a picture form. So as we go through in order, um, we have the um, action potential traveling down an axon. So what this means is that your neurons don't go on forever. Eventually one neuron ends and the next neuron picks up that signal. So this is called the synapse or kind of the passing on of the signal between two neurons. So the axon comes down, action potentials cause these calcium channels to open. So calcium travels into that axon. And what calcium does is it, through a series of chemical reactions, it probably binds or it tells these synaptic vesicles to release their contents. And the contents are those triangular shaped neurotransmitters. And it releases those neurotransmitters by exocytosis. So remember exocytosis, the vesicles kind of fuse to the wall of that cell membrane and kind of vomit or spit out their contents. The neurotransmitters get released and they will bind to receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. And again, the postsynaptic membrane, think of this as neuron number two that's receiving the new signal. And this is a zoomed in look at what's happening. The neurotransmitters bound to the receptor sites. So the neurotransmitters are the triangular shapes and that binding of the neurotransmitter will cause the sodium channel to open. So this sodium channel now will open and will start the propagation of an action potential because we know when sodium channels open, sodium rushes into the cell and sodium rushing into the cell starts our depolarization of that next neuron. Yeah, levels of potassium are really important too because we need proper levels of potassium because we need to establish the potassium gradient of more potassium inside the neuron. And we need potassium to do the sodium potassium pump. The sodium and potassium pump cannot work if we don't have enough um, levels of both ions. So, you know, maintaining your ion concentration levels is done by your kidneys. Your kidneys help do that a lot. Your, a lot of your blood is filtered in your kidneys and your kidneys help to maintain proper ion levels. And then your blood takes those ions to all parts of the bodies that need them. Our bodies are pretty amazing. I think you guys should be, all become doctors and then remember me. You can give me a little handout when you become surgeons or plastic surgeons, what doctors make the most. Dermatologists make a lot of money too, but it's not about making money. You guys should do what you're passionate about, but there is a doctor shortage. There's a nurse shortage. There's just a healthcare shortage. Um, there was a healthcare care shortage before COVID too. So if this is interesting to you guys, you are going into a very, good field where there's huge job security. Um, would a person having low calcium levels, would they have slowness in their nerves? Maybe um, low calcium levels before they might, before they would affect even the nerves, they might affect other parts of the body too. Um, muscle contraction, good questions. What are some symptoms that happen to the body when the sodium potassium pump cannot work property, properly because of its levels? The sodium potassium pump is so important. Um, if, if it's not working properly, I mean, quickly, quickly, I mean, the nervous system will shut down because the sodium potassium pump is needed to establish the resting membrane potential. So without the sodium potassium pump, your cells could, main, could remain in this hyperpolarized state where they're too negative. And if your cells are too negative, no amount of sodium entering can get them up past threshold to generate an action potential and be stimulated. So without the sodium potassium pump, I mean, your nervous system would just become kaput. And without your nervous system, you'd quickly die because your nervous system innervates muscles. It innervates your heart, your brain. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know what would happen first. I mean, heart, yeah, I, I think you just would, yeah. You just would become brain dead. Good question. Um, usually the amount of ion levels is easy to control. The, the more, what you might hear of more is there's not enough of ATP. So ATP is what is required to maintain the sodium potassium pump. So ion levels are important, but 
when we hear people like dying or something goes wrong, it's usually because they don't have enough ATP, which is your body's energy currency to activate the sodium potassium pump or ATP is used everywhere in the body for a lot of other things. So um, you might hear about like lower levels of ATP. You know, if you're not eating enough, your body isn't getting the glucose it needs to create ATP. There's just, everything's kind of intertwined, but you guys should go on and take more classes. That's what you should do or become doctors and nurses. Okay, should we keep moving on? Oh, and I didn't mean to stop share. Hold on there. Okay, back to the PowerPoint in reflexes. So here we are in reflexes and reflexes are really fun and interesting. Well, it's all fun and interesting, but if I've lost some of you, hopefully this will be more interesting for you. A reflex is an involuntary reaction in response to a stimulus applied to the periphery and transmitted to the central nervous system. Reflexes are very important because they allow a person to react to a stimuli, usually pain, um, more quickly than is possible if conscious thought is involved. Most reflexes occur in the spinal cord or the brainstem rather than actually getting up into the brain or a higher brain center. And a reflex arc is the neuronal pathway by which a reflex occurs. And it has five basic components. And then we'll talk about some examples of reflexes. Um, so a sensory receptor receives the sensory stimuli that could be pain. Um, let's see what we have here. We'll talk. Okay. The sensory neuron then kind of is the pathway that takes that sensory information to an interneuron, which is a neuron located between the communicating and communicates with the two other neurons. The interneuron then is connected to a motor neuron, which takes out a motor response to an infector organ like a muscle or gland. And the simplest reflex arcs do not even involve an interneuron. So they'll just go right from a sensory to a motor neuron. So let's talk about a quick example here, um, a sensory receptor in the skin, for example. That's the first step of a reflex arc. It travels through the sensory neuron into the spinal cord, through the interneuron. So we notice here we're not traveling up to the brain at all. Then it travels out through a motor neuron to a skeletal muscle. And an example of this might be, um, I like to use this example a lot. If you touch a hot stove, the sensory receptors of pain or temperature in your skin will feel that. And without even going up to the brain, you'll have an immediate response to lift up. The muscles in your arm will lift up to try to remove your hand from that hot stove. So that's an example of a simple reflex arc. Yes, Kathy, so low calcium levels, I mean, if they are extremely low, they would affect the, the action of releasing those acetylcholine, yes. Um, I'm just going to talk, we don't go through it, but I'm going to go back to this picture. So another really simple reflex arc is the doctor hitting his rubber hammer on the patellar ligament. So there are receptors called spindle fibers that take that up. And, you know, that really simple, um, action from the doctor, he's really testing your reflexes, but more so than that, he's testing your nervous system to make sure that your nervous system is responding when a stimuli is applied to a sensory receptor. So that simple action of the doctor hitting the patellar ligament underneath the knee with his rubber hammer, you know, your knee kicks out automatically. And if that were to happen and the, and the response would be a little slow, the doctor would probably say, okay, the knee is still kicking out, but it's not happening right away and there might be a problem with the nervous system. So that idea of the rubber hammer, the knee kicking out, that's testing the reflexes. And they might also test, you can test your reflexes in the ankle with the Achilles tendon and in other parts of the body. But um, what your doctor is doing is it's a simple way to test the nervous system for being fast or slow enough. So that's what he's doing. You never pass that test, Yolanda. Well, I think you're okay because you're asking a lot of great questions. So I think your brain is working just fine. What do you mean you never passed it? Was it just, do you know why? Are you talking about the knee jerk? It's called the knee jerk reflex. 
I'll let you respond. Your knee never moved. Was the doctor ever um, concerned? Okay. Maybe the doctor didn't know what he was doing. I don't know. I think you're fine too. Thanks for sure. I'm sure you're fine. Cause I mean, that's a great test to test your nervous system, but if something is really wrong, you'll obviously see other things kind of start to degrade. Okay. I think we're just going to get through part one today. We have about four slides to get through. And then part two, we'll go through a little more in depth of the central and peripheral nervous system and how we break down like the spinal cord in the brain, but we'll probably do that on Wednesday. Um, so we'll talk about neuronal pathway converging. So these are the pathways that your neurons take. Your central nervous system has simple to complex neuronal pathways, a converging pathway. So one that converges is a simple pathway in which two or more neurons will synapse with the same postsynaptic neurons. So what that means is if you kind of have two neurons coming together, they might converge and synapse on one postsynaptic neuron. This allows information to be transmitted in more than one neuronal pathway to converge on a single pathway. And then a diverging pathway is a simple pathway in which an axon from one neuron synapse or diverges on more than one postsynaptic neuron. And this allows information to be transmitted in one neural pathway to diverge into two or more. So converging between synapses, we have two or more axons converging on one postsynaptic neuron. And diverging means we have one axon and then we have it synapsing or diverging on more than one postsynaptic neuron. So this is an example of these neuron pathways. Um, here's the direction of the action potential. Letter A is showing converging. So we have these two axons converging on one postsynaptic axon. And then B is called um, diverging. We have one presynaptic axon diverging on more than one postsynaptic. Um, multitasking, um, not necessarily. This is just the way that your neurons can really efficiently send down information. So for example, this action potential, this one axon could send on its signal to more than one axon, not necessarily multitasking. That might have something to do with something else. Summation, um, a single presynaptic action potential usually does not cause a sufficiently large postsynaptic local potential to reach thresholds. So many presynaptic action potentials have to come together in what we call summation. Summation just means we're kind of putting together all these signals and neuronal pathways, and this allows the integration of multiple subthreshold local potentials. Sub summation of the local potentials can bring the membrane potential to threshold and actually trigger, trigger an action potential. Spatial and temporal summation, I don't know how many questions we'll have about this. Spatial summation occurs when local potentials originate from different locations on the postsynaptic neuron. For example, from converging pathways and temporal summation occurs when local potentials overlap in time. This can occur from a single input that fires rapidly over and over again which will allow the resulting local potentials to overlap and spatial and temporal simulation, um, summation can lead to the stimulation or inhibition depending on the type of signal. So I'll go ahead and stop the recording.